love this family. I love this family. I love this community. It just, oh, I mean, did you feel it? Could you feel it? I just, I love worshiping with you all. I love seeing the response. I love hearing the stories that come out of your life. Um, this is pretty incredible what we have. So a question, and I think I already know the answer to it because I've kind of seen it lived out in your life. Have you ever, have you ever just been blown away by God? Have you ever experienced something and you could not explain it other than to say that had to be God? I've, I've experienced that. I've had that in my own life, but Maybe one of the most impactful moments and experiences that I had um, was wrapped up in my call to ministry. See, I had already been wrestling with God. He had already been trying to call me into something and I didn't know what it was. And I had a job that I loved, I was very happy in, and God was trying to get me to leave it. And I was like, yeah, thank you, no, appreciate it. Um, you can move on to the next person. Uh, but I had finally, after a while of, of wrestling with him, I had come to the point, because he kept saying to me over and over again, he kept saying, I have something for you, but I cannot give it to you until you give up what you have. The control freak in me said, I don't think so. But I did finally, after a couple of years, get to the point of surrender where I thought, I don't want anything else in my life except whatever it is that God has, because I just believe that he has something for me. So I'd gotten to that point, but I still didn't know exactly what it was. I didn't know it was ministry. I'd kind of started getting an inkling. So I did the thing that you're supposed to do, which is to go talk to one of your pastors. And I did that and I'm like, am I crazy or am I being called to ministry? And she said, huh, same thing. Uh, but <laughs> so we were, I was, I was praying, I was trying to figure out what it was I was going to do. Um, and so it was just a Sunday morning, just a Sunday morning. And I went into um, the church. It wasn't this church. It was another one. And walked in, sat down in the pew with my family. And we sang, we prayed, we did all those things. And then the pastor got up and he began to preach his message. Um, and then he got to a point where he started telling an illustration and it was a story of Simon Birch. And Simon Birch is this um, odd sort of character who doesn't really fit in, but felt like God had made him for a purpose. And while this pastor is preaching and talking about this story, there was a stained glass window right up uh, where I would, could see it. And the light came through that stained glass and just hit me square in the face to the point that it was so bright that everything else around me turned black. I could see nothing except I could hear, still hear the voice of the pastor telling this story. And I felt the most overwhelming sense of God's presence in my life and on my body. And I just felt like he was affirming my call. And tears started, you know, going down the cheeks. I couldn't help it. And at the end of the service, I walked out and I locked eyes on the other pastor that I had been talking to. And she looked at me and she said, that was for you. Because she saw it. She saw it. And I thought, that's, that's crazy. Like, how do I even describe what happened to me? It's unexplainable. We are starting a new series called Unexplainable, where we are looking at the movement of the Holy Spirit, what he does, how he reveals himself to us, what he calls us to. And I feel like we're gonna have a lot of stories like that to share, a lot of stories that are hard to describe other than to say it had to be God.
So where do we go in the Bible to kind of talk about these sorts of stories? Well, of course, we are gonna go to Acts. It's the greatest place that we could go to. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter two. Um, But let me just kind of give us um, a context because we're really gonna look at the disciples and I, I want us to not forget kind of what their experience has been. Now, they have... Uh, they have been having these incredible moments with Jesus. Because remember, these are ordinary people, ordinary jobs. And first of all, most incredible that Jesus called them and said, here, follow me. He said three years and they have walked with Jesus. They've heard him teach. They've seen him heal. Um, And they've been listening to him tell people that there is this new covenant, this fulfillment of the law, God has this full salvation plan that is being revealed through Jesus. And so the the disciples have been hearing that. And then they are hearing Jesus say, you know, I'm going to die. And and it's happened. He dies. And he says, you know, he had promised three days later, I will rise from the dead. It happens. Resurrection, three days. And then Jesus gets to walk this earth again for 40 days. And then right before he ascends into heaven, he tells the disciples, wait here. I want you to wait in Jerusalem because I have something for you. I have a gift that is going to blow you away, but you have to wait for it. And then he ascends to heaven. And so, you know, the disciples are now kind of looking around going, um, What do you think, three more days? I don't know, that's how long it took for the last time. What do we do? So they did what they knew how to do, which is gather together, they worship together, they prayed together while they waited. And then 10 days later, Pentecost. Pentecost is a festival that they have been celebrating for generations. It's really the festival festival of the first fruits of the harvest. So this is one of those times where you would have uh, Jewish families, Jewish men come on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So everyone is gathered in Jerusalem and then it happens. Acts 2, chapter, um, chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them." Imagine, imagine being there. Imagine experiencing that. And then imagine trying to describe this to someone else who's not there. They had experienced the Spirit of God come on top of them. And in their heads must have been um, images and words from the past. They, They had to have thought about the tabernacle, how God's presence had been at the tent of meetings where his presence was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire at night. They had to be thinking about the words that they knew, Ruha, God's breath, and how that breath came and gave life to Adam, um, gave life to the dry bones in Ezekiel. These images and these words is what they had to rely on to try and explain the unexplainable. But once again, here is God's presence. So how how do you explain this? How is it that you put words to explain the unexplainable? Well, sometimes what, if you can't explain it, you can explain the effects that come out of it. For example, look at this photo here. This is a rock formation um, that you think it did not start out looking like that, right? But do you know it was the wind that created it? It was the wind, even if we didn't see the wind, even if we haven't experienced the wind, we can see the effects of the wind and how it has shaped, how it has transformed this rock. For me, my life, I cannot convince you that it was the Holy Spirit 
that came through as light to reveal God's purpose for me. I can't convince you of that, but I, maybe I can show you the effects, the ripple effects that occurred. The very fact that I am standing here today as one of your pastors is a ripple effect of this experience that I had with the Holy Spirit. Now, we know that when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, when we experience it, something happens and it creates in us this need, this urge to respond. The disciples, how did they respond? Now they could have, after experiencing this, they could have thought, oh my gosh, this is amazing. We should, stay, we should start worshiping. Like someone grab a liar or something, right? Like let's, let's worship together. Let's have a potluck and talk about it. Uh, let's study the other places in God's word where we see the word breath or spirit or something. They could have done that and that would have been okay. That's not bad, but it wasn't God's purpose for giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, when we encounter the Holy Spirit, it is not meant for us to retreat inside. It is meant for us to move out. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming within us. Not so we retreat in, but that we go out. Now, I am a parent of four. And I'd like to say I'm a pretty good parent. I'd ask my daughter over here, but I'm afraid she might answer. Um, but I am. I'm a great parent. And I have great kids. I do. I have great kids. I enjoy spending time with my kids. I like going out to dinner, seeing movies, swimming. I love doing all those things. But what I really want for my children is for them to grow up and move out. That's not a bad thing. It means I'm a good parent, right? I want my children to grow up. I want them to sh learn how to share their life with someone. I want my children to learn how to share their gifts, maybe through a job, through volunteering, through their church, whatever. I want my children to grow up and then one day have their own children and teach their children and on and on. I want them to grow up and move out. And when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, it is not so we retreat in, but that we move out. It doesn't always mean a physical move. Sometimes it's a move out of our comfort zone. Sometimes it's a move to a new plan or a new vision, but it always causes a response. So how did the disciples respond? They didn't stay in the room. They went out. Look at uh, verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Now, let's just stop here for a second. Let's just celebrate who this was. Who was it that spoke boldly? Peter. What do we know about Peter? He had the rockiest road of any of them, any of the disciples with Jesus, right? Peter, bless him, he ups and downs. But when he encountered the Holy Spirit, we see a transformation, we see a change. And so he stands up, not by himself, he stands with his community, the other 11, but he stands up and he starts preaching boldly. And he actually does two very simple things. He shares scripture and he shares his experience. He shares scripture, he shares his story, what he knows. Verse 17, he says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He's sharing from the prophet Joel. These are God's words. He's sharing with them God's promise. This is what God had said already. And look, this is coming true. What you're experiencing is exactly what God promised. And then in verse 21, I love it. This is again, from prophet Joel, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, everyone. Not just the disciples, not just the Jewish people, everyone. God had a plan of salvation that was going to ripple through everyone. Peter didn't have to understand it. 
Peter just had to be obedient to share it and to trust that God's word was true. And that's what he did. He shared what um, God's word was and then he shared about Jesus. He shared his experience. He had been walking with Jesus. He knew this man. He had seen it. He had witnessed it. And then he got to share with everyone else what he saw. Verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, has poured out what you now see and hear. This is my Jesus. He was on this earth. He is God. He received the Holy Spirit. He was raised to death. This is true. I believe it. This is what God says. This is my experience, my story. Then what happens, verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And I love this, let's just stop here for a second. They were cut to the heart. That was the Holy Spirit. See, Peter didn't have to convince them. He just had to share God's word. It's the Holy Spirit's responsibility to transform us, to speak to our hearts. So they were, the Holy Spirit touched their hearts. Um, They were cut to the heart, What, what do we do? What do we do? So Peter says, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and you and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and all who are far off for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, that's preacher talk for I'm gonna keep talking for a long, long time. Um, Or mama talk, whatever, same thing. Okay, with many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How many? 3,000. That is unexplainable. There is no other way we can explain what, that ha- what happened there except to say that had to be God. So they encountered, these people encountered the Holy Spirit. And then what happened to them? They're like, what do we do? And Peter says, repent. Because that's what happens when we experience the Holy Spirit. We don't want to be our old self anymore. We don't want to fight God anymore. We want to be new. We want to be the new new creatures that God has promised. We want to get rid of the sin. We want to be transformed and be different. There are ripple effects that happen when the Holy Spirit comes on us, then what comes out of our lives are ripple effects that other people can see. And it even says, this is for you and your children and all who are far off. This is a lot like the illustration that we've seen a lot, you know, the whole um, oxygen mask illustration, you know, the flight attendant tells you if the oxygen mask drops, then you put it on yourself first, and then what do you do, right? Then you help the person next to you. Now, what would happen if you put your oxygen mask off and you went, that is unfortunate. (laughs) Well, I'm good though. I've got this life-saving tool, um, But that is, gosh, wish you had it. No, you would be a horrible person if you did that. No, you put it on yourself and then you share it with the person next to you. You don't keep it for yourself. If you've got the best thing coming, then you want to share it with the person next to you. That's the ripple effect. What would have happened or what happens if we don't share it? Carolyn Moore is a a pastor um, in Georgia, and she uh, has this great study on the Holy Spirit. And here's a quote from her book that I love. Through Peter's boldness in preaching this message, the Holy Spirit stirred the hearts of 3,000 people, and a movement was born. In those early days, that movement was like a flood. But today, in too many places, it has been reduced to a trickle. Ow. Ripple effects. 
When we experience the Holy Spirit, when we are transformed, when we share it with the person next to us, there are ripple effects. We are um, products of a ripple effect. Somebody somewhere was transformed by the Holy Spirit, was excited about what they knew, and they shared it with someone who shared it with someone who shared it with something, and somehow you got invited here. In fact, Harvest, this place, this community that we are part of is a ripple effect because 20, 21 years ago, the Holy Spirit stirred in the hearts of people of this church to start a community called Harvest. And yes, it included staff members like Bob Swan and J.D. Wall and Chris Tomlin, but it wasn't just them. And they came together and they said, this is what God is calling us to. And they were faithful and obedient and it grew and it changed and it came over here. And then we had this beautiful building that was built. But this is not harvest. Harvest isn't just this space. And do you know, by the way, this is pretty cool. Do you know any given Sunday, we have over 2,000 people, about 2,500 people that worship in harvest. But when you all come at Christmas or Easter, we have well over 5,000 and we have no place for you. So thank you for taking vacations and thank you for worshiping online with us. Um, right, so, but we grow and we grew not because of us, because of the Holy Spirit and God's not finished yet. He's not, he is still calling us. In fact, last uh, fall, uh, Mark Swayze talked about this. Um, so a couple years ago, really, the Holy Spirit started stirring in our team saying something is happening. God is calling us to be a part of something. We don't know what it means. We just want to be obedient. And so we had the fall series of awakening because God said, call your people to pray. Call your people. And so we had this whole series. We um, had a time of prayer. Remember, we had 20 days of prayer, except for when Harvey wouldn't let us come here. And we, we lined up here and we prayed and we brought our prayer requests forward. And we just felt like God was binding this community together, was calling people. And so we went through this and we knew that was good, but God was already planting a seed because of that phrase, and all who are far off. We knew that God wasn't finished with us, but he wanted us to begin with prayer. So the Holy Spirit has continued to move. The Holy Spirit has continued to shake us and we believe is moving us and now is the time. So we feel like God is calling us to start Harvest Home Groups. Why? Because Harvest is not this place. Harvest is not this building. Harvest is not a preacher. Harvest is not a worship leader. You are harvest. You are the preachers. You are the teachers. You are the storytellers. God came to dwell within you. When we had the tabernacle, God's spirit, God's presence was the cloud and the fire. And when, they, when it moved, the people moved. But God said, that's only part of the plan. Then Jesus came, the Holy Spirit came on him because God wanted to show his people that his presence didn't reside in a, reside in a building, it resided in a person. And then Pentecost came so that the Holy Spirit could reside in every single one of us. And so God is calling his people who are filled with the Holy Spirit to do the same two simple things that Peter did. Share scripture and share your stories. That's all we're asking. Just share scriptures and share your stories. And so we have a plan in place over the next few weeks. You're gonna hear more details, but let me just give you an overall vision of what we're going to do. So Harvest Home Groups, the first thing we're gonna do is we are putting out a call for leaders. If you feel the Holy Spirit stirring within you, and you wanna be obedient like Peter, what we're asking is that you would just go out into the foyer and we have these um, slips, just write your name and write your email and then pin it on the map kind of close to where your house is. If you wrote legibly, that would be awesome, um, but whatever. Uh, so for the next three weeks, we're going to be looking and asking who wants to be a leader, who wants to host in their home 
one of these Harvest Home Groups. And we're gonna gather you together. You're gonna get an email that just invites you to a vision night. And we're gonna worship together. We're gonna pray. We're gonna discern. And then out of that, as we feel, um, you know, those people who say, yeah, this is for sure exactly what God is leading me to, and we affirm that, um, we're gonna walk with you as, as leaders. Now, putting your name out there doesn't commit you to it. It just says, I'm interested in learning more. And then... Um, after that, when we're walking through the leaders, later on in the fall, we're gonna put a call out to anyone who wants to be a part of a Harvest Home group. And these are groups that will meet any day, any time, whatever works out and however the, the Spirit leads. And so we're gonna help you get in with a group, but again, it's not just about you. It's not. It's about putting together a place where you can invite your neighbors, you can invite your coworkers, you invite others who won't go into this church but so that the word can get out. And so you're gonna meet and we're gonna equip you. And it's really simple. Um, We're gonna give you a guide that will come out on our app every Sunday evening. uh, And it's gonna be based on the message. And it's five points. We're gonna give you questions. We're gonna give you talking points to gather, plant, grow, harvest, and pray together. And through that, we believe that this is how the Holy Spirit is asking us to grow beyond our walls, to grow out and say, you know what? Trust me, you are not your building. You are your people, and we believe in that. So this is what we're gonna do. We believe that the Holy Spirit is moving. We believe that it's ca- the Holy Spirit is calling us not to retreat in and have a great time, though it is awesome when we're all together. But to not be satisfied until all who are far off have heard the good news and know that there's grace and love and mercy out there for every one of us. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, we really wanna come just before you and open ourselves up to you. However you want to use us, we wanna surrender ourselves to you. However you wanna reach out to your people, if you can use us, Lord, use us. If you wanna lay us aside, lay us aside. Father, all we want is to be in your will, to receive the gift that you have promised us and to walk and share this gift with others. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this family that we get to walk with. May everything we do honor you and exalt you. It's in your name we pray, amen.